Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? It seems like a lot of the games coming out have been simply sequels. And even looking at the hardware, it, it looks like a lot of it is just iterations on previous designs. So that's kind of gotten me thinking, is the video game industry running out of ideas? Okay, so to get something kind of out of the way first, I know some of you wondering, dude, what's the deal? You're in the car. You said you weren't going to be doing any more of those in the car for a while. To tell you the truth, I tried to record one of these over the weekend, not in the car. I didn't like the way it turned out. During the week, the only time that I really have to record these is during the commute. And that was kind of the concept behind this series to begin with. Go watch the original episode. I'll include a link up there. Uh, to understand what this is all about. So anyway, I didn't like the way the previous non-in-the-car version turned out, so I'm doing it again. I've had to do this a few times with previous versions of these, of these episodes, so nothing new for me, but that's why I'm back in the car. Anyway, so the topic is, has the video game industry run out of ideas? It's, it's kind of a cliche almost at this point with the movie and TV you know, media conglomerates and industries that, you know, all the movies and TV shows that we've been seeing are really just kind of rehashes on previous ideas. But, you know, I've been looking at the state of the video game industry and there have been things that I've seen it do that kind of make me wonder if it, it isn't suffering kind of from the same symptoms. A lot of games seem to be either sequels or rehashes on the same type of gameplay. Um, sad to say, first-person shooters, I think, suffer the most from this. And I'm not saying that, you know, all first-person shooters are the same. They're not. But of all the different genres of gaming, the ones that seem to have the most parallels with each other the ones where you can just sit down in front of it and play it the first time without really needing to fully understand how to play the game, but still do okay, it's first person shooters. And we've been seeing a lot of sequels in that regard. But it's not just FPSs that, that I think have been dealing with this. There have been lots of other genres where we've been kind of seeing this repeat where it seems like a new game that comes out is the same as a previous one, maybe with just like a different name or different characters or just a different skin on it. You know, you sit down and you're like, well, you know, there's nothing really new or novel about it. And even potentially with the hardware, it's kind of gotten me thinking about, you know, the PS4 and the Xbox One. Is there anything really materially different between them and say the PS3 and the Xbox 360. <sighs> Not a whole lot, right? I mean, they, they really kind of act the same way. There's nothing incredibly huge or novel about them, at least if you look at a comparison of things like, you know, older generations of consoles where there have been massive increases in performance, like noticeable changes in the way that the games play and also in the way that you play those games. Um, you know, a great thing that I'm thinking of, a great parallel is the difference between the Super NES and the N64. That was a massive generation leap. If for no other reason than you're going from this largely two-dimensional, low, pretty low-res platform, well-loved, but, you know, it, it had limitations to its technology, to this massive leap where now you've got much better and more realistic support for 3D types of games. You've got a major advance in the way that the controls work. It's not just, you know, a D-pad and a bunch of buttons to mash. Now you've got like an analog stick. Now you've got multiple buttons. Uh, now you've got trigger buttons, that sort of stuff. And then even the graphics, you know, it, it was a major change in the way that games were played. It, it wasn't all just side scroller kind of stuff 
we started getting into the more environmental type of gaming, I should say, where it's less of a linear track and more of an open world. I mean, the, the classic example is look at Super Mario World versus uh, Mario 64. I mean, that those two games I don't think could be any more different. And that was just one generation apart. The number of those changes, I think, has really decreased as time has gone on. You know, so looking at something like the Xbox to the Xbox 360 to the Xbox One, has there really been any fundamental change in the way that that console platform has operated? I mean, there have been, of course, add-ons for it. Connect was a big one. Um, as relatively short-lived as that was. There have been, of course, quality improvements. I mean, you know, every generation of console has offered better performance and image and sound quality. But they haven't really changed the way you play. In fact, the Xbox controller is probably one of the best examples um, of, of game controls not playing. I mean, the controllers across all three of those consoles have been remarkably similar. And Sony's not really off the hook either. That controller has hardly changed at all in the four generations of PlayStation consoles. So, you know, it's 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 kind of gotten me wondering, are, are we really kind of hitting the limit of what the mass market, what the general public has been wanting out of video games? There have, there have been and always will be niche add-ons. Um, you know, PlayStation VR is... I want that to succeed, but and I've talked about this before, but it's really just going to be a niche add-on, I'm afraid. I, I, any of the VR stuff I don't think is necessarily going to represent the way that all gaming or the vast majority of gaming will go towards in the future. It's always going to be this, this kind of corner thing. There have, there have been plenty of other add-ons as well. Uh, PlayStation Move, Connect, like I said. Um, even things like the Wii Balance Board. Dramatically different. Um, ways of interacting with your console, but ultimately not really all that different, right? They, they, they still are just add-ons to an existing control scheme. The, the Wii, I think, was probably the brightest spot in terms of innovation. And I've kind of talked about the Wii before as well. But it's, it, it really tried to show, look, there's more to gaming than just up, down, left, right, A, B. You know, there's, there are new ways to interact with the game and to pull you into the experience other than you just pushing this avatar around on your TV, pulling you more into the game as you yourself and not you just mashing buttons to make a different character move. But even that proved to be, I don't want to say a flash in the pan because the Wii was a very popular console and lasted a long time. But the whole motion control scheme for controlling games is pretty much gone. I mean, we don't see that really used a whole lot anymore. Um, you know, Microsoft uh, tried it with Kinect, PlayStation tried it. It didn't really take off that much. Um, so it's, it's just back to, you know, using controllers again. You know, the games. Like I, like I said, a lot of them are sequels, but even if they're not sequels, some of them seem to be just iterations on the same thing or continuations of a franchise. Um, in some ways, that gaming may have even kind of reverted a bit. I mean, you look at the Mario franchise and you've got just this classic side-scrolling platformer eventually breaks into that open world exploration thing with Mario 64 and Super Mario Sunshine. But then what does it do? Well, it tries to expand on that by moving into things like Mario Galaxy or the Mario 3D Land 3D World kind of stuff. 
But those, to me, have actually been a step back in that they put you back on a linear track. It's not just, hey, go wherever you want in the world. There's, you know, this, this goal you need to try to meet, but you can take all these different paths to try and achieve that goal. You know, the games in, in the Mario franchise have become more linear again. And, Mar and Nintendo even went back to kind of that classic Mario theme with the whole new Super Mario Brothers platforms. Um, for the Wii and, and the Wii U. And back to just a regular 2D side scroller. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just left wondering why haven't we seen these massive new innovations in, in gameplay, new exciting franchises? Not to say that they don't come up, um, because there are new franchises, and when new franchises hit, they generally do really well. Splatoon is one um, that comes to mind right away. That was a brand new franchise. It's a new type of gameplay. I don't think Splatoon really kind of fits into any other molds. I mean, you're controlling a character in the first person, but it's not really a shooter. You're running around trying to achieve a goal, but it's also kind of an open map type of a thing. So that is why I think Splatoon ended up being the, the sleeper hit that it became. Not so much that it was just like a new franchise from Nintendo and people were hungry for a new franchise, but it's because it, it was so different than all the other stuff that had been coming out before. Another game that comes to mind is Rocket League. Rocket League started out very small. In fact, I got my copy of Rocket League as one of the free PS Plus titles that you get. Like they were giving it away for a while, for a month. Um, and that's how I got a copy of it. Now you go out and buy it. And it's like, it's treated as if it's a typical AAA title. Why did Rocket League do so well? Because it is a new thing. It's a new way of playing. It's not a rehash on the typical thing. It's not a traditional sports game. You know, it's, if, if Rocket League was just a game where you run around and play soccer, nobody would care. You know, we'd just call it FIFA. It's not a racing game. It's not where you're just driving around, you know, in a car. It'd be any other typical racing game, and, and it would just do like how any other racing game would do. Rocket League did really well because it combined a bunch of stuff in a new novel way. You're in a car, but you're kicking a giant soccer ball around. But you have to deal with car kind of physics in order to make it happen. That is where I think we really need to keep pushing towards is, is these new ways of playing games and not so much can we iterate on what's already been out there to try and make the gameplay tighter or to make the controls better or to come up with better storylines and all that. I mean, all those things are great and they're nice to have, but what I think we've really seen borne out is that people are just hungry for just new, new and fresh. You know, just coming out with, with a, a new title isn't enough. It's got to be different. It's got to really stand out there and stand out there on its own and not have to rely on past releases to help, you know, push it along. Name recognition, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, you can't rely on name recognition to sell the product. You know, a certain number of, of people are always going to buy anything that comes out that's got Mario in the title because they enjoy that series. But how many people will pick up a brand new title from a name they don't recognize that looks like it's different? Well, you know, there's, there's gonna be some people who are just like, I wanna stick with what's familiar, but you get these new and fresh titles out there and then word spreads and then they grow up. I mean, Rocket League started out as a small indie title. And it's taken a while for it to kind of get gotten the notoriety that it has as being a really popular game. And it's still a popular game now. People are still playing Rocket League. It wasn't like a one-off type of a deal. So it, it, it's, it's got to be more of kind of an organic growth, I guess is how they call it. And not so much, a, you know, major press release blast and big marketing push and and try to you know get the day one sales to be as big as they can. And all of that I think leads to what I suspect the real problem is. I think the real problem isn't 
that the industry is out of ideas. I think it's that the business aspects of the industry have taken over too much. I think because gaming has become like this legitimate form of entertaining in its own right that isn't limited to certain uh, uh, pockets of the population. You know, you don't, you can be anyone and play games now, I guess, uh, is what I'm trying to say. You know, when I was growing up, it was games are for kids and games are for dorks. Games are for nerds, you know, when I was growing up, um, when games were still new. Now it's like regular, you know, quote unquote, regular people play games. And you don't have to be young. Adults play games, kids play games, teenagers play games. It's, it's a normal part of society now. And with it, that market has grown, but become, I think, more commercialized. It, it, the, the, the companies involved feel like there's more at stake. And so they need to think more in terms of commercial success and less in terms of artistic expression, I guess. So those companies are gonna invest in what they feel statistically will generate the most sales. You know, what, what's the safe bet? What's the biggest benefit they can get for the least cost without taking much risk? And that's why I think we've been seeing sequels and, and seeing kind of just continuations of typical gaming hardware. I mean, even Switch, Nintendo Switch, it's, it's interesting in what it is, but I mean, let's, let's face it, Switch isn't really new. Switch is the gamepad from the Wii U that has the console built in. That's kind of what Switch is, you know, and, and you can take the controller part off and hook the thing up to the TV and play it on the TV. If they added video out to the gamepad and built the processor into the gamepad, you'd have the Switch. So even Nintendo, while they're trying to do something new, they're still playing it somewhat safe. Because I think it's a money thing. I think it's that they, they, they don't want to take that risk. They don't want to invest a ton of money into something on a gamble and, and have it flop. Where I think the big bright spot in all of gaming is and I've mentioned this before, I can't remember which podcast episode or video it was in, was it's indie game developers, indie game studios. That's really where the novelty is gonna get driven from. And it continually amazes me how fun games can be, even when they're incredibly simple. You know, you, you look at a game like Cluster Truck. How simple of a game is Cluster Truck? You've got a whole bunch of semi-trucks driving towards a goal. You need to cross the goal line. The semi-truck drivers don't necessarily drive well. There are obstacles in the way and the ground is lava. It's, it's pretty simple in terms of gameplay. You're just jumping from truck to truck is your goal. Jump from truck to truck, don't touch the ground until you pass the goal line. And the graphics on that game are incredibly simple, but it's so much fun. I mean, that game is, is, is a blast and it's fresh. A game like Gang Beasts, it's, it's, it's got its roots in fighting, but it's got this twist with the environmentals. The environmentals, are as big of a part of the fighting as the actual mechanics of fighting. And that's something we haven't seen much of. And yeah, the graphics are pretty simple. I mean, you're like, you know, kind of these clay doll blob things that are, you know, flopping around and there's not a whole lot of detail or texture or anything to it, but that game is fun and it's hilarious. And both of those came from independent studios and there are just tons more, tons and tons more the, uh, plenty of them I'm sure I don't even know about, haven't played, haven't heard of. But it's because those indie studios don't have the overhead. They don't have the baggage of needing to appeal to stockholders 
and they don't have their their brand name, their brand recognition necessarily on the line, where they're expected to keep pumping out, you know, big sellers both by their fans and by the people that invest in those companies. Those indie studios, they they're free to do a lot riskier stuff and to do things on their term and on their time frames that the major studios and and hardware developers can't do. And I really am glad that gaming has evolved to allow those indie game studios to not only survive but to grow and do well. I think it was a, a, a really good idea on the part of all the hardware developers for consoles to to open up their their store platform so that you can just sign up for an account to sell your games. Things like Steam are a fantastic idea, um, you know, for the PC side to give you this nice marketplace where you can go and discover all this stuff. And of course, with the rise in social media, this has also helped to get the word out about a lot of that stuff. You know, if it wasn't for YouTube, I wouldn't have heard of Cluster Truck or Gang Beast. It was watching Let's Plays of the betas of those games, you know, before they were kind of generally released, but just, you know, YouTube Let's Players got copies of those games earlier and did game and did, the, you know, Let's Plays on them. And that helped get the word out on those titles. Those, those companies, the studios that developed those titles, they didn't need to spend a bunch of money on marketing because they're nimble and flexible enough where they're taking advantage of established channels that gamers already tend to watch. We've been starting to see the major studios take advantage of this too. They've been getting better at seeding reviewers copies of games ahead of time and, and working with all that. But it's, it's really, I think, the indie studios that are going to drive game play, at least, towards newer and more exciting places. We can only hope that with that, the hardware manufacturers for console gaming will maybe become a little more emboldened to try new things. You know, maybe Maybe it involves coming out with multiple product lines. You know, instead of just having the PlayStation product line, maybe Sony, you know, decides to, to go for it and come up with another gaming product line that is a little bit more out there and, and uses hardware controls in a new way. You know, maybe PlayStation VR gets spun off onto its own thing where it can be optimized specifically as a VR experience instead of just as a bolt-on for an existing console. You know, I don't know. I'm just throwing ideas out there. But I am hoping that we break out of this whole iterative kind of model. We break out of this whole, you know, we can only do what's relatively safe for the company in terms of money type of model and really get into that kind of era of massive growth with every generation again because those were exciting times, you know, the 80s and the 90s. Um, they, they were huge differences between each console generation and you couldn't wait to get the new one because you knew the new one did stuff that your current console just couldn't do. You know, they, they, they felt way different. They felt way newer and it, it was exciting. Whereas now it's like, ah, PS4 Pro, you know, it's nice, you get better graphics you know, maybe better frame rates, but is it this wow factor over your existing PlayStation 4? Not really. So I guess those are my thoughts. Um, I am curious as to your thoughts. What have you thought in terms of the way games have, have been going? Yeah. Do you think there is any hope for the major studios to try to kind of break out of this mindset that they've been in? Do you think I'm full of crap? Has there been plenty of innovation from the major players that I'm just totally oblivious to or, or omitting or forgetting or whatever? Leave all your thoughts down in the comments below. Of course, I'm also soliciting feedback and suggestions for future podcast topics. So be sure to hit me up with your ideas down there. Again, sorry I'm in the car on this one. I'll try to do more that are not in the car, especially since it's so freaking dark out. 
But in any event, if you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcome. And as always, thanks for watching.